Thank you that your power is in this moment. Lord, I look around this room and I see so many people for whom if it hadn't been for you, they wouldn't be alive today. Your grace is sufficient. Send the kind of anointing today that breaks bondages and yokes off of families from now until the end of time when you come. Father, we praise you. Lord, I trust you. Lord, I pray that today marriages will be renewed, restored, that homes will be put back together, demons will tremble, chains will fall, and that the power of the gospel will go forward. And Lord, may somebody get Jesus out of their church and into their house today, into their bank account, into their business, Father. Lord, Holy Ghost of God, you're just welcome to just stir us up any way you want to. You've already been stirring. And so today, I'm asking you to just continue to stir us and to speak as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen and amen. Like I said, a few weeks ago, uh, we started with this idea of talking about mind your own business. Mind your business, not talking about keep your opinion to yourself, which is not a bad idea, but to actually mind your business We've been talking to entrepreneurs, we've been talking to people in this room and by internet who are interested in being more than just a Sunday church goer. I, there ought to be an amen right there. I can tell you're sleepy people. I said some people are interested in being more than just a Sunday church goer. We want, we, want, we want Jesus to be in our financial state. We want Jesus to be in our lives and a gospel that is real will go outside of this building and go home with you. And what we've hit on in the last few weeks, and if you, I would beg you to go back. You can get on our Facebook page. You can go to my YouTube page, wherever you need to go, and find these first messages and get grounded in some of the things that we're talking about that God has given us. Few th let me just go back because a few things that we've established uh, so far is that God has made a covenant with Abraham years and years ago and he repeated that covenant saying that he was going to give you the children of Abraham the power to get wealth I'm not a prosperity gospel preacher I don't think that God came to give you a Cadillac or to give you a Ferrari or to give you a Learjet but I am an economic empowerment preacher I'm not a prosperity gospel preacher but I believe that in America God has a way especially with 90% 80% of the world going to bed hungry at night you live in America, God's given you a way to get up and get out. Come on, help me, somebody. And if you can't get up yourself, sometimes you can, you can find somebody who can help you get up and get out. And so we've established that God has made a covenant, not with us to get wealth, but God gave us the power to get wealth, the ability to get wealth. We talked about men of multiplication, which was, I am finding out now a couple of weeks out from that, that was a demarcation line in the sand moment for a lot of men and some women in this church. They realized that God has called us to be multipliers. Then last week we talked about women being managers, minding their business, having beauty in the balance, all this stuff with all the plates and everything spinning in the air. And I would encourage you, if you're a busy mom, which I don't know any mom that's not busy, if you're a busy woman and you're trying to figure out how to make all this stuff make sense in your life, I would encourage you to go back and find that message, beauty in the balance. And so we've established a lot of biblical principles, and we've done it at a high volume, have we not? It's been pretty cool. It's been awesome. And we're going to take two more steps in this, this week, and then, of course, next week. And I say again, please don't miss next week. Whatever you do, uh, come next week. I want you to understand something about Vineyard Church. I know a lot of you come in, and you're here for a little while, and then you go about your business. This is becoming a church that you don't need to miss, period. We don't ask you to come three or four times a week. If you come on your own, you come on your own. We have one Sunday kickoff. And if you're going to be grounded in this church and you're going to become grounded in your faith, you need to be in this church every time you can get in here on a Sunday. Say amen, somebody. This has been a church where you can float in every three or four months and get some word. You can't do that because like some of you haven't been here for whatever reason. Some of you are visiting, you haven't been here. You're going to have to catch up with some things that we're doing because the revelation of God is progressive and you jump in and you're going to be like, I'm not really sure what they were talking about. If you'll come to church more often, you'll get some more Jesus on you. Amen. 
And this is not a church, I'm going to be honest with you. We don't give chintzy sermons around here. We don't give you little placating worship services. We come in here ready to rock, ready to rumble, ready to go to battle for you. And I, I want to battle for your family. I want to go to battle and go to war for your future. But I can't do it if you're laid up in the bed not caring about church. Amen, somebody? And I know that sounds legalistic in our generation. I know that sounds old school. But let me tell you something. Not everything that's old school needs to be thrown away. And so you need to be in the house of God. You need to be in a moment. And it is a different spirit than laying in your underwear in your bed, flipping through your favorite preachers on a Sunday. There's something about being in the presence of God that makes an impact in your life. And men, if you're married, bring her with you. She's waiting on you to say, honey, we're going to church this morning. And so let's get it. Let's get it right. If we're going to be Christian, let's be Christian everywhere we can. Say amen, somebody. And I don't know about you. With all the hell some of us are going through, some of us need to be in church every time we can get in church. Amen. Because we're going to fill you up. And I want to help you and I want to fill you up and pray that God will bless. So this church is becoming geared toward this is a, you just don't want to miss a Sunday here because it's it's God every single Sunday doing amazing things. I want you to look this morning with me as we take number step number four, I believe, in this uh, little sequence of messages to Psalm 91. Many of you know Psalm 91, and I'm not even going to read all of it today because if I get to reading all of it, I'll just get all messed up and go off down rabbit trails because it's a beautiful psalm. But I'm going to read verse 2 of Psalm 91 and use this as a springboard for a conversation that I want to talk to you about. And uh, if you'll hang with me, I promise it'll be good. Psalm 91, verse 2. You ready? Say, I'm ready. It says this, I will say of the Lord, he is my, say it with me out loud, refuge and my what? Fortress. My God in whom I trust. That's so good. I'm going to read that again. That's like crumbling cornbread up into buttermilk. Amen, somebody? Any old people in here? I will say of the Lord, he is my what? Refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. That's good, isn't it? Everybody look this way. I need your voice for a second. Will you say this out loud? Just say to the person next to you, say, hey, neighbor. Hey, neighbor. My money is building something. God, I hate church people that don't know how to shout over a title. My money is building. No, you done lost your chance now. Just sit there, act like a Baptist. My money is building something. And it's not just any old something. I'm getting myself together, and I'm not going to be a haphazard anything anymore. I'm going to use the resources God's given me, and I'm going to build something that's going to outlast my life. My money's building something. All right, let's talk. You know, um, years ago, the original motto of our nation was not, in God we trust, or something like that. Do you know what the original motto of our nation was? E pluribus unum. You say, say what? Yeah, E Pluibus unum. It's a Latin term that means out of one is many or one from many, which is how the United States was formed. It refers to the transformation of colonies into states and states into a, watch it, a united nation. Can you imagine what would happen if the body of Christ would actually get united? We have had in the Christian history of the Christian church, in the hi Christian history of the Christian church, we have had over 7,000 different reformations or reformations. To put it in good language, we've had over 7,000 splits in the church. We split over wearing of makeup, that it's a sin to wear makeup. I think it's a sin for some not to wear makeup, to be honest with you. We have split over the over music styles. We have just cut that out of the video if you don't mind. 
We have, we have split. Think about what we've split over. We don't split over big doctrinal issues anymore. We split over worship styles. We split over, over carpet colors and power struggles. And I, I'm just, this is an aside, but I'm believing by faith that if God could work in us and cause us to come together, there is power in unity. Communities where churches come together find power in unity. We need to be united. Well, in 1776, follow with me in this line of thinking for just a second before I get to revving my motor. In 1776, the Continental Congress convened, and they convened with John Quincy Adams, Ben Franklin, and Thomas Jefferson. And these three men were brought together to design a new seal for this new emerging United Nations that are coming together to find a seal and affix it to a motto. And these men actually came up with five different designs, and all five were rejected. They started out in 1776, and they couldn't get a consensus until 1795. They were given the task in 1776, and they didn't reach a consensus until 1795. I want to say to somebody here today, whatever you're working on, trying to become or produce in this world. It is not going to take you as long. God is getting ready, whoever I'm talking to today, I'm already speaking prophetically to you, God is getting ready to expedite the paperwork. He's getting ready to cut through the red tape and get rid of all the bureaucracy because we have a God who can cut in time in half the time and half that you've been told that it would, that it would take for you to accomplish your dreams. Watch him bring it together. Finally, in 1795, the men came up with a slogan for the new nation, but in 1812, war broke out. It was between the Spaniards and the new occupants of the new land, and at the end of the war, both sides claimed victory. Only in America do losers feel the need to be celebrated. Amen, somebody? And finally, in 1864, in God we trust was suddenly brought to the forefront and it was placed on the coin that was worth two cents. Now hang with me and listen with your heart. A coin for two cents had in God we trust engraved on it. By the way, the two cent coin was the lowest um, valued coin in the nation. There was not a single coin, a single you know, one cent coin. It is off of that coin that we started saying as we interject our opinions into people's lives, we say, well, I'm just putting my two cents in. People understood something way back then. Watch this. I'm only putting my opinion on something that I trust God to handle. I'm putting my two cents in. It means I'm trusting God with the opinion I'm giving you. It is above me, it means. It means it's beyond me, and I am believing that God has the authority to deal with my belief system. Starting with two cents, and now from the two cents all the way to the $100 bill, and even when we had $1,000 bills. Think about this today, ladies and gentlemen. I need your mind for just a minute this morning. In God we trust started with two cents and then went to a $100 bill. When you can trust God with two cents, you can have trust that he'll deliver to you a $100 bill. Can I ask you a question while you're sitting there so reverently and quietly? How much are you honest to God, trusting God for in your life? If you are trusting him for two cents, I want you to know if you've learned to trust him for two cents, God can lead you to trust him for something bigger in your life. And if you are trusting him for something that is exponentially larger than what you can save or what you can earn, then you know you are putting your trust in God. I need you to understand today, the money in your bank account, as much or as less as it is, the money in your wallet, the money in your purse right now, the money in your 401k, the money in your coffee can, in the, in the cabinet, I want you to understand the big principle today, and it is simply this, your money has a prayer life. Your money has a prayer language. 
Now, you do understand that this nation was founded by Puritans and by Quakers, built on religious freedom. So it was the intention, watch this, that every time a transaction of money was made as vendor shops and markets began to grow in our country to the vendor or to the shop owner, I would give you the two cent coin or what would come afterward. Watch this. I'm giving this currency believing that what I am purchasing is going to work. So I am giving the shop owner, I'm giving the grocery owner, I'm giving the whatever, I'm giving the person my prayer on coin in God I trust. Understand, when, the, when they coined this phrase in 1795 and later put it on the, the currency, there was no such thing as warranties. There was no such thing as car insurance. You couldn't get AAA to come get your horse stuck in the mud somewhere, you know. So whatever it is that I'm purchasing, I trust God to sustain it. I trust God to maintain it. I trust God to protect it. Every time they gave a coin, and even to this day, when you purchase something, you are not just saying, give me, give me, give me, my name is Jimmy. You are actually saying to the owner or wherever it is, I am trusting that the money that God has entrusted me with, that this money is going to go to something that's not going to break down, that's going to wear on my feet right, wear on my back right, take care of my family right, I am giving you the prayer of my currency. Anybody with me today? Let me ask you a question. Over the last 60 days, when you bought something, did you pray over it first? Did you pray, Lord, I'm on a limited budget. I don't need this to break down. I don't need, so I don't waste this investment. Now, I know in this generation, this is weird because we're disconnected from all of this today, coins and stuff, because we do everything today through PayPal and Venmo and Cash App and things like that, Bitcoins and all kinds of stuff. So we're no longer using the transaction. But I need you, listen, to build in this kind of an economic atmosphere that's going to get worse I need you, Christ followers, to build the level of an intercessor in your life. An intercessor is not just a gift of somebody who prays over others, but you need to build the gift of intercession around your bank account that every time I spend, it provokes me to prayer so that when I'm going out to eat, I have prayed over it before I have paid over it. That when I paid for it, I first prayed for it. So when I'm in the line at the store and I make a transaction, I say, Lord, I trust you to make this purchase. I trust that healing is in my family. I trust you that this product won't fall apart when I get home. Let me take it a step further. Lord, I trust that what I'm acquiring will maintain its value. Lord, I trust you that the person selling this to me is not playing me. Lord, I trust you for this. Now, that doesn't shout many of you Christian people. It doesn't make you because y'all are used to slaying demons and wanting to see angels flopping around and flying through the dead, all that stuff. But here's the problem in the church. We got all this anointing and we broke. We have no money management. We have no retirement. The Christian people in America right now, especially south of the Mason-Dixon line, are some of the most broke, disgusted, anointed people on the planet. And I don't want Jesus to just be in your Sunday shout. I want him in your bank account. Can you imagine expanding your prayer life to your finances? The number one cause of divorce is financial. Can you imagine putting prayer, honey, sir, into your checking account that prayer can develop your consumer uh, consumption that every time I pay for something, prayer is laced to it. That will mess you up the next time you're tempted to go to a strip club. I told y'all you're not in a normal church today. I mean, how can you use something printed that says, in God we trust to do something and use printed uh, statements and then prayer to buy things that are illegal? 
How can you use printed prayer to buy things that are detrimental to your family? How can you use a printed prayer to buy something that will hurt your future and hurt your children and kill your body and your mind cells and your brain cells to to do something that's... uh, In other words, if you put prayer in the middle of of your consumer mentality, you're actually saying, Lord... I'm praying about what I'm not sure about. You're actually placing prayer where there is not any certainty. Today, I want today to be a monumental moment where you stop thinking about where you are and we move you forward to where God is going to, watch this, to where you're going to hand off something to the next generation. Because it's not about you and your four. It's not about you and getting your hundred bucks for your new Air Jordans. It's not about you and your toys. We are one of the most selfish generation of Christian people in the world. We are in America. We're fat. We're bulimic. We we get entertained. We get ticked off when somebody puts some regulations or a little structure underneath us. We just want our own ministry. And by God, nobody's going to tell me what to do. Or I'm going to go to some other church. And that's why you keep hopping and God uses you about this much because you've not learned structure in your life. And if you don't learn structure in your life, you're not going to be used of God in this place or any other place for that matter, especially when it comes to the resources that God has for your life. I am preaching already. So let's let's dive into it. Just going to bounce a couple things off of you and I will let you go. Psalm 91 verse 2, throw it back up there, says it begins and says this, I will say of the Lord. Stop right there. I can preach all day. You're going to have to say, you're going to have to learn to verbalize in God I trust. You're going to have to learn to trust God out loud. That's good preaching right there. I'm going to say it again. You're going to have to learn to trust God out loud. Hey, you little quiet people who just love to keep your Christianity all in your spirit and in your heart and on your little Instagram and your Snapchat whenever you feel like doing something motivational and spiritual, you need to quit that mess. You're not going to last 15 seconds when hell comes down your doorstep. What God is looking for is somebody who can say of the Lord. Stop trusting him in silence. Say something that suggests, God, you got me out here. God, you put this in front of me. You've got me covered. And God, I'm going to go after this because this is what you've promised me. And God, because of your namesake, you said. You said what? You said in the time of trouble, you will supply my needs. You told me my, that, that, that all the riches of heaven, that the wealth of the wicked are laid up for the just. You told me, God, that I am your supplier and I am your king and I am your shield. And when you feel all discombobulated, I am your buckler. I'll pull your bank account back together. You said that to me and I believe you out loud. I need to ask you today, is there anybody in this room today who can trust God out loud for the dreams and visions that he's put down in you? You ought to make a little bit of noise today that there's dreams in you and there's visions in you and there's things and ministries in you that have never come to pass yet, but they're getting ready to. You say, well, I feel weak. Well, Brother Joel has a word for you in Joel 3.10. He said, now let the weak say, I am strong. I am strong. I am strong. I am strong. Can you imagine the joy that I am taking God literally at his word? Watch this. Not my words. That he will do for me exceedingly and abundantly. Because all this past two years, Brady, I've been complaining and I've been depressed and I've been sad over what I can't afford, how low my credit score is, and how, and listen to me, God has heard all your carnality and your flesh. Now, when are you going to start allowing your faith to talk? Because your faith has been mute. Question. What do you believe God for in your marriage, in your life, to get out of that 9 to 5, 8 to 4 job? I wish Dolly Parton would have sang 10 till 3, working 10 till, don't you, amen? What do you believe in God for? Watch me, y'all. Hey, you're Christian, aren't you? You're saved, aren't you? 
okay, 14 of you. Hey, guess what? Let me ask you something. What do you believe in God for to do supernaturally in a pandemic, in a nasty economy, with screwed up, goofy politicians? I don't like any of them. With gas prices soaring, what do you believe God for? Watch this. That does not match your finances. What can you believe God for that's not in your checking account yet, but only in your spirit? What do you think God is capable of, watch this, of doing in your life or your family that nobody else in your family tree has ever been able to attain? If you don't have that kind of faith, then just keep on throwing your money away. But today, if you will listen to the voice beyond this voice and begin to listen to what the Spirit of God is trying to say, based on all these weeks that we've been building this with you, if you will hear some things, you will hear that your money is getting ready to do some proclaiming for you, if you make the right sacrifice, if you make the right investment, if you don't blow it on stupid stuff and begin to realize a few good things that the Word of God says about you, you can change, you can destroy, you can turn on the enemy the spirit of poverty that's been in your family tree, the spirit of lack and, and build prosperity that will make an impact in this world. Watch this, starting in your own house. So many times the problem in the church is we mentally agree with God, but we verbally disagree. That's why Psalm 91 verse 2, put it up there, it says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and He is my fortress. Why are these terms important? God uses two descriptions that are military in nature. First of all, he says, this is real quick, this is free because y'all look like nice people. He says, he says, he, he is a refuge. Somebody say refuge. refuge. What is a refuge? You know what a refuge is? Show them Isaiah if you hadn't got it up there. A refuge, it is a safe shelter for what's chasing after me. Why do you run to a refuge? You run to a refuge if you're in danger. I only go to a refuge if I'm under threat. Anybody with me? Or if I feel like I'm in trouble. I only listen, I only seek refuge if I'm ooh, if I'm on the verge of being put out of somewhere. Or I only seek refuge where I'm not welcome somewhere and they're trying to get rid of me. For instance, uh, the, I, I pray every day for my friends that are in the Ukraine. I, I've been to the Ukraine. I've been in Kiev. I've been, I've been all over that, that beautiful, beautiful, with some of those beautiful nation with the most beautiful people in the world. And I pray for those Ukrainian people who have been put out of their homes. And I pray they find safe refuge. Well, guess what? God knows how to cover you from every entity that keeps trying to evict you. God is trying, listen, for every purpose that God has for your life and the enemy's trying to evict you from that purpose, God says, I am your refuge. He is a refuge. Oh, somebody needs to hear that. He is a refuge. A refuge for what? He is a refuge to repossess every possession the enemy has stolen from me. You know what God wants somebody to know, and not everybody's going to get this, but for the three people looking at me today that will get this, God says, I am giving you currency for your refuge. God, I need the refuge of currency. I trust you to build a refuge so my family is safe in this economic climate. I need a refuge of currency so my, my business will grow for God's glory. Lord, I need uh, the refuge of currency so my utilities will never get shut off again. God, I need the refuge of currency built around me so my family won't have to sleep in the car 
car anymore at night. God, I need the currency of refuge so I won't have to send my children to the relatives or to the neighbor's house. God, I need you to help me build a refuge of money around my house so I will never have to tell my children that they can't go to college or they can't go to trade school or they can't do something with their life. God, I need you to make currency my refuge. And he builds the refuge through me. Today in this room, I feel Jesus in this place. You may not. Today I pray somebody here find how to build that kind of a refuge. Why do I pray that for somebody? I pray that for somebody who is stuck with an abuser. And you can't afford to leave. God is getting ready to build your refuge. For others today, God is getting ready to give you a refuge so you can finally walk away from a job you hate and build a career that will help your family and, the way, and, and give you the joy that you deserve and walk in his assignment. For others in this room, God is getting ready to build a refuge through you so you can quit working to make the first and the 15th your life story. Let me ask you something, church people. Who do you think God is that you would prostitute your purpose, whore out to your purpose for God just so you can pay for a phone? Huh? How in the world can you say, I'm going to put my gift on sale and spend my entire life working for something just so I can go buy a toy or a trinket or go on a trip or buy a new pair of shoes? Who do you think God is? Do you not think God can't provide you shoes and toys and trinkets? God let the Hebrew children walk across the desert for 40 years and their shoes never wore out. Children's shoe sizes never changed. God is trying to tell some of us something. I will give you what you need so you won't have to spend your time spinning your wheels over what I can easily provide for you. Honey, look at me. Girlfriend, quit stressing over your future and start trusting God to build the millionaire entrepreneur mentality in your life. God proclaims this to us. I am giving you enough resources for refuge. Ooh, that's good. That's better than I thought it was going to turn out, to be honest. But then he said, I'm not only your refuge. Watch this, sports fans. He says, I'm your fortress. God says, I want to give you resources so you might have a fortress. What is a fortress, Brady? A fortress, watch this. I put half the definition up there. I'll, I'll tell you the rest. A fortress is a domain that can't be penetrated. Now let me finish it. Something that the enemy can attack but can never break into. That's a fortress. You need the kind of financial strength. I know you don't hear preachers say this. You need the kind of financial strength that no matter what kind of bills attack your house, you won't even feel it. Now, you didn't hear me. You did not hear me. No, you didn't. You, can you imagine a mechanic saying to you, the engine on your car is fried and you need another one and you don't even sweat it? Because you got your fortress built. Can you imagine? Oh my gosh, uh, storms came through, leak in the roof, and you say, Hire this roofer and handle it ASAP. I got my fortress built. C come on, y'all. Can you imagine? I know this is not shouting, but can you imagine while driving down the road, you see a beautiful, new, upgraded house for sale? Just went on the market with more room than what you need, than, than you need. More room, more room is needed. And so you see and you say, man, that's more room than what I've got right now. And you don't even second guess purchasing it because you have believed the God that you trust in who said, I will give you houses that you did not build. 
Have I said one thing to you about you being a multi-gazillionaire and parading around on your yacht? God says, I want you, I want to put you into a resource fortress for you, your loved ones, your children, and your children's children. I'll show you that in a minute. Even if, listen, watch this. I want to build your resource a fortress so strong that if you have to take in your aging sick parents, even if you have to take in your nephews or your nieces, even if you have to raise your grand youngin, even if you have to finance your siblings, it won't impact or alter your lifestyle one single bit because you spent time building your fortress. God says, I'm building you a fortress. You know what Ecclesiastes, show them Isaiah, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 10 verse 19 says this, money answers all things. Here's the amazing thing about that verse. It says money answers all things, but in the verses before it, nobody asks the question. Money's the answer for everything. Well, what's the question? It never raises the question. Why does no one ask the question? I'll tell you why. Because this is God's way of saying it doesn't even matter what the question is. If you've got a fortress built, no weapon. No weapon. If you've got a fortress built, it don't matter what comes against you. My God, you're acting like Presbyterians. If you've got a fortress built, it doesn't matter what the enemy throws at you. It doesn't even matter what the question is. I am giving you enough fortress to answer it. I speak prophetically over you right here. It doesn't matter what the question is. God says, I want to give you enough money to answer it whenever it does come. It doesn't matter what the question is. You're going to have optimum health care for your parents. Help me preach now, somebody. It does not matter what the question is. You and your children will not have to live in lack. It does not matter what the question is. It matters what answers the question. And if you've got a fortress built, you got the answer. It doesn't matter. And look, and don't get it confused. It's not me. It's the God in me that's building it. My father is rich in houses and in land. And he's rich in those things so I don't have to run around begging you for help. God will do it for me. I want to speak this over somebody in this room. I am praying for every like-minded believer that God is going to give you enough ideas and concepts and power to acquire fortress-building money that you will have to build for the you and the next generation, and he can release fortress resources over you. I speak over you that you will retire comfortably one day and ahead of schedule. I speak over you. You are going to do it because you are called to it, not because you have to do it. That thing stirring around down inside of you, God is going to build a fortress up so you can become the minister and the world changer that is buried down inside of you. God is building, but God has got to build a refuge and a fortress around you. God says, I'm going to do it through you, not for you. God says, I will fortress you or shield you. I'm giving you money. I'm, I'm going to go a step further. Because some of y'all are at the bottom of the barrel and I'm going to help you come up right here. God says, I'm going to help you build a fortress to shield you finally from bill collectors and collection agencies. Oh, that don't shout church people right there. That, that, that to shield you from the IRS, to shield you from student loans, to shield you from medical fees or shield you from divorce fees, uh, to shield you. God, I need a fortress in my life. Mm. Woo. See, what you ought to be doing right now, now that I have to teach y'all what to do in a, in a financial sermon, because apparently y'all don't get it, what you ought to be doing right now is cussing out your, the enemy. You said stuff, what? Yeah, I said it. Did I stutter? Cuss out the enemy. Tell the devil's the only one you can tell go to hell and you ain't cussing. <laughs> ain't that true? You know what you ought to be saying? Why am I the only one preaching up here, Nick? You ought to be preaching this better than me, baby girl. 
You didn't think, hey, let me help you. Apparently y'all need it. Devil, you didn't think I could get out. You didn't think I could recover him. You didn't think I would ever have it this good. You sent me all those mental pictures of being a bag lady, pushing myself, living in a car, pushing my goods around. You gave me all this. You never thought I'd be this way. You never thought I would have bank account that was filled. I'm not even going to spend my time trying to defend myself because, devil, my money is building something for me. I don't even have to tell you what he's doing through my life, devil. Just sit back. I can watch that my God is an awesome God. He is my God. He is my king. He is my banner. He is my buckler. He is my high tower. He is my king. He is my Lord. He is my refuge. And by God, devil, he is my fortress. So just sit down, devil, because you shot your best shot and it didn't work. You DM the wrong Christian. You got in the wrong inbox on this one, baby. I've got my refuge coming. I got my fortress being built. I'm not all the way constructed, but I'm better than I was. I'm telling you, your money can silence your critics. Your money can make your critics come running after you asking for favors. Your money can, can silence your naysayers, your, neg your negative family members. That's why you are in trouble. The moment you speak against an anointed child of God who believes the word of God. Because when your words attempt to take away wealth, influence or passion from somebody who has been entrenched with glory, God will replace, watch this, when you speak against them, God will replace at least twofold what you attempted to strip from your, with them from your words. I got, I got to say something to somebody here. I've been thinking about you this morning. Whoever's in this room who's ever had to completely start over twice. Twice. I hear you. I hear you applauding. I see you looking at me. Whoever I'm looking at who's had to go back to z zero and start over twice, God told me to tell you, your cup is getting ready to run over down into your saucer. Your saucer's going to run out into the floor. My money's getting, and you're not going to have to say a word. You just stand there with your lips glued together, praise your Jesus, let your money build something for you. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you can get there. I need your voice. If you've ever bounced a check, say this out loud. I will never bounce another check another day of my life. Somebody say this out loud. No more overdrafts. You're stupid. You say, I got, well, I, I had to write a $5 check. They're going to charge you $30 to do it, ding dong. If you ain't got five, you dang sure ain't got 35. Oh, they don't shout there, David. They just stop. Do you hear that? I want you to hear this. I want you to do more than for God's sake sit in a church and listen to some preacher. You will never, if you'll get what I'm trying to tell you people and take this Jesus home with you, you will never have to live the first and the 15th ever again in your life. You won't ever have to avoid a cash register for three or four days because you can't pay for it. I'm telling you that God's resources will build something and do the talking for you. L listen, listen. I want God. Can you tell I'm passionate, by the way? I want God. If you don't believe it for yourself, I'll believe it for you. I want God, look at me, to so densely bless your life that you are scared to start testifying about his blessings. I want the blessing of God to be so overwhelming for you that you keep thinking, this is too good to be true. Now let me tell you this. Look at me. Y'all with me? 
If you don't start thinking generationally, hang with me, hang with me. I need you to look up here. If you don't start thinking not just about your now, the now is refuge and build a uh, a fortress, right? But if you want to really get into your Bible, you need to start thinking generationally. I, if you, listen, if you don't think generationally, you're really wasting your Christian talk. If you don't think generationally, it doesn't matter what God does for you right now. Listen to me very closely. Too many of us have sabotaged our success because of what other people have spoken over our lives. And you got to start thinking not about your now. Watch me, bro. That's why you're broke right now. Because all you care about is right now. But those little babies are going to grow up. That child's going to grow up. That house is going to dilapidate and need repairs. Things are going to happen. And you've got to start thinking generationally. I started this sermon series with you and, and, and hit the men talking about the promise that God had given. Remember we read in Deuteronomy where God had promised to the children of Abraham, their father, the father of our faith, that they would get the power to get wealth. That was in Deuteronomy. A book called Genesis is before Deuteronomy. Right? Is that right? I want to show you how you can start to think generationally. How many of you have children in this room? Raise your hand up. How many of you have grandchildren? Raise your hand up. How many of you great-grandparents? Raise your hand up. Oh, we got some grand, we got some great-grandparents here. Y'all started early. Hey. How many of you, I'm going to need your honesty, how many of you in this room have seen poverty and lack in your family tree where people just don't care? All right, let's get it right today. I'm going to show you how to fix it, but look at me. You've got to look up here. You've got to lock your eyes on this bald sucker. I know it's tough to look at. I need you to look up here at me. I need you to be still. I need you to watch what I'm fixing to do because I'm fixing to blow your mind. Because I'm going to show you today and next week how to build generational wealth. Because if you just do it for yourself, all you're going to be interested in is how can you blow it and you leave your kids. And they they learned nothing from it. Do you know 98% of lottery winners are broke within the span of five years? Destitute broke. Okay? We don't want that for you. We're preaching this so that you will destroy generational poverty and build generational wealth, okay, in your life. All right, let me, let me, let me, I'm going to read you two scriptures. We'll be done. I want you to see these. Thank you for listening. Genesis 14, verse 14 through 16 says this. Now when Abraham, watch this. Now when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, watch it. He armed his 318 trained, what's that next word? Servants. Ooh, there's something there. Ooh, there's something there. Just hang with me who were born in his own house and went in full pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces of servants against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Skullbone. Which is north of Damascus, just testing you. So he brought back all the goods... (laughs) And also brought back his brother Lot and goods as well with him and the people. Y'all look up here. Oh my gosh. You know what you know what the Lord showed me about this? It says that he took 318 trained servants. He didn't say army people. He didn't say Air Force. He didn't say army people. Abraham took servants and won a battle. You know you're anointed when you can take less and do more with it. I just shouted you and you missed it. You know God's got a plan when you can take less and do more with it. And so they win this battle with 318 servants. They, they, they just walked off with Manhattan Chase, Chase Bank, opened up the vaults, and left with all the gold and the stuff of that town. Watch this. On the way back home, he encounters, Abraham encounters this king, priest, name, you know the name, you've probably seen it, named Melchizedek. Melchizedek is actually a picture of Jesus in the Old Testament. He's without a mother. He's without a father, without a beginning of days. He's both priest and king. Now continue. Watch this. Verse 18. Look what it says. 
Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now, that's a party right there. He was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram. Watch this. He's not Abraham yet. In his mind, blessed be Abram of God most high possessor of heaven and earth and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Watch this. Watch this, y'all. This gets good. And he gave him a tithe. A tithe. A tithe. What's a tithe? A tithe is a tenth. It's like a dime on a dollar, right? He gave him a tithe of everything. Let me tell you something. That was one smiling king right then. Then give me the persons. Watch this. Now, now the king... Of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. Watch this, watch this. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I should not take anything that is yours, lest you say, I have made Abram rich. Now, this is great wisdom, watch me, don't go to sleep. This is great wisdom for somebody who's at the bottom, who's just now starting to come up financially and get your life in order. For people who are on their way up and for some people I'm looking at today who are finally on their way out. Here is the great wisdom. Be careful who you let bless you. Because people will always say, if it weren't for me... If it weren't for me, you wouldn't be where you are. I, he says, I'm not taking anything from you, king, because, I, in fact, I'm going to give it all back so that you will never say it was you that made me rich. I want to tell somebody I'm looking at in this room. There are some blessings. Look at me. every eye. I need the whites of your eyes. There are some blessings that you ought to turn down. Faith doesn't just accept, give me, give me, my name's Jimmy. Faith also rejects. I could go home right now. That's worth the whole sermon right there. Faith doesn't just accept. Somebody tweet that one. Faith also rejects. It takes faith to say no. I'm not going to use your money. I'm going to build my fortress with my own money. It, no. To, it takes faith to say that. No to some blessings that look easy and they look quick. I want to say to somebody, watch out for the quick and easy. Because they may be quick and easy, but they may not be divine. To be discriminating in who in who God on who blesses you and be able to say, if it's not from God, I don't want it. Again, I want to repeat this from a while ago. If you don't start thinking generationally, you can't talk with God. Too many of us have sabotaged our success because we're missing God. And so Abraham just after this, you know, Abraham's like, God, what are you doing in my life? Remember? Remember what God said? God said, you're going to be the father of the faith. And Abraham's like, what am I doing? Genesis 15, 1, watch this. Look at the first verse. After these things, stop right there. Wait, but stop right there. What things? What things? After Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, after he told the king, nope, you're keeping your side of it, lest you say you made me rich. In other words, after he sacrificed to build the fortress of God in his life. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, I, I line these out because y'all look like nice people. Number one, do not be afraid. Fear not. Can I ask you something? Why would a God tell a man who's rich, fixing to get richer, and be the father of the faith to not be afraid? Because God knows you have to have courage to get blessed in the way I'm getting ready to bless you. The way your money's getting ready to build some stuff, you better be ready to build the fortress and the refuge, and you better have some courage. Many of us have self-sabotaged our own success. Watch this, y'all. Because we have continually surrounded ourselves ugh, with people who keep enabling, enabling their poverty mentality on you. 
And you keep saying, Lord, bless my house. Bless our bank account. And you proclaim that you want a blessing, but you keep making decisions that abort the things that God wants to do for you. Like what? You want me to tell you? Like maxing out your credit cards. Like buying stuff that has no profit in it. You keep putting blessings Putting your blessings into things that are going down rather than invest in things that are accruing in value and going up. Why? Because you don't have the courage to go against the grain and be a different person. You'd rather look blessed than be blessed. And the first thing God told a man that he was getting ready to be blessed was don't be afraid. Why? Because it takes courage to get blessings from God to put in the work and not waste it on stuff that doesn't matter. Look, I'm not talking about this false look of being blessed where these mink coats are going to double wides. Oh, y'all don't see it in Milan? Come to Nashville with me. We got all kinds of rich honeys walking around and brothers all around. And man, they just all fly. They get in their car and they scared to drive their car up into their driveway because somebody's going to see what they live in. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about the reality of being blessed. You know what somebody said to me recently? To me personally said, Brady, living fake rich will get you real broke. One, two, one, two. How great is our God. He says, don't be afraid. Watch this next. I am your shield. Why is God telling Abraham, I am your shield. I am your protection. Watch this. Because anybody who's coming up is going to get dart shot at them. When you start building up your refuge, Orchard Boys, look up here. You can sleep later. When you start getting your crap together, getting your life together, lady, when you start getting your stuff together and you start getting your fortress built and start becoming somebody that's not a waster but an investor, people who knew you back when are not going to like your new success. You got to be tough to be blessed. You will come up under attack the more successful you become. Can you stand to be blessed? Can you stand the level of attack to be blessed? Do you have the faith to trust God to always cover your back? So God, so, so God said, Abraham, don't worry, man. You Just be a good courage. I am your shield. I got you covered. And then he said this. Here we go, y'all. Woo, I'm racing to get to this. Then he said, Abraham, I am your exceeding great reward. I don't have time to preach to you, but I did go to college to learn the biblical languages. I might as well use a little bit of it because it cost me a lot of money to go to that school. The word exceeding means infinite. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Drop it in your heart. Put it in your mailbox. God is saying, Abram, hey, Abram, I am your infinite, never-ending resource provider. There is no limit. Glory to God. Y'all, I believe it for myself. Y'all just sit there. I know you're ready to go eat. But maybe if you'd stop eating and start learning, you might get out of debt. You, there is no limit to what I can do for you. If I stop right there, I've preached. That's it. It'd be worth it for me. I'm preaching to me, I guess. God says to somebody who's got the guts and courage to believe him for more than an hour a week, for God's sake, to believe him for a, 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 a purpose with money attached to it, God says there's no limit and there is no ending to what I can do for you. Since you give me what's in your hand, I'm going to release. I'll tell you more about this next week. I'll release what I've got in my heaven. You release what's in your hand, I open up the windows of heaven. You give what you got, I'm going to give you what I got. I am your exceed. Because you sacrificed, because you sowed in tears, you're getting ready to reap in joy, baby girl. I am your exceeding great reward. Oh, God, people, 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 if you, Vineyard, if you would ever believe what I'm trying to tell you, 
if you would ever believe what I've just read to you, it would stop, if you would stop putting limits and boundaries on what God could do in your life. I'm so sick of preaching to people who don't believe. They always agree, but they don't believe. And if you would stop putting limits on, and boundaries on what God could do. In fact, y'all, God blessed Abraham so much that when Abraham died, he died and he couldn't use up all of his infinite exceeding blessings. You say, really? Even today, Abraham's descendants are still living out this promise from God that he is, God is an exceeding great reward. And if I could just be real with you and not, and y'all don't think I'm racial or anything or bigoted, I could take you around the world and show you from Manhattan to all over this world Jewish descendants that have built refuges and fortresses for themselves and their children and a pandemic and high gas prices and screwed up politics has not even touched or affected them. I'm telling you, y'all ain't going to believe me. I'm telling you, if you could just somehow stop being a little church monkey and get this word down in your spirit and not spend or waste your blessings then God is going to release on you and on your children and on your children's children refuges, safe places, fortresses, a place that the enemy cannot come in. He says, be of good courage, Abe. I got you, man. Hey, I'm your shield. I got you. And I'm your exceeding great reward. Now listen to what Abraham said back to God. Verse 2. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Then Abraham said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, "There is this one shall not be your heir, the one in your house, but one who will come from your body, O dried up man will be your heir. Verse 5, then he brought him outside, and you know this scripture right here. Look now toward the heavens, Abraham, and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Oh, there's so much juice in this. But let me, let me land my airplane by telling you a couple of things. First thing, when God told Abraham this, Abraham was not broke. And Abraham answered God. When God said, I'm your exceeding great reward. You know what Abraham said? My problem is I don't have a son. Oh, if I could get into this. Because you can't have true success without a successor. You better start thinking generationally or you will miss this point. And church people are hard to preach to today about this. Because they're only interested in their 30 second TikTok video. That's it. You better start thinking beyond your little scope of imagination if you want to do this and you want to get in this because you better start thinking generationally or you're going to miss it. God starts talking to Abraham about this exceedingly great reward. Watch this, y'all. And Abraham starts talking to him about a son. Abraham thought like God. He had a God mentality. He wasn't about his little stupid ministry. Yeah, I called it that. Because anytime your little ministry is all that matters, it's stupid. Unless you've got the guts to think big. I want my ministry to outlive me. Don't you, Nick? I want my ministry to outlive. If I drop dead or die on the way back to Nashville in a minute, I want my ministry, I want to have somebody behind me, whether it's a physical son, which I do not have, but I do have some spiritual sons that I poured into and daughters that they can pick up the mic and pick up right where I left off. He was thinking generationally. Lord, if you're going to be my exceeding great reward, here's what he's saying. Lord, let me tell you, I don't have a child. If you're such an exceeding great rewarder, I need an heir to catch 
the rest of this reward. And it's the 21st century. And y'all, they're still catching the blessings of this promise. Oh, young people, look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Thank you for being here. When so many young people are falling out of church, thank you, young people, for being here. You sit tight for a second. You have no idea who you are. Because your mama and daddy are fixing to get this word and start believing it. And your mom and daddy are getting ready to start building a fortress and a refuge. And your mom and dad are going to become the cup, but you're going to be the saucer. The blessing on your parents' lives can fall onto you. Watch me, kid, but you have to position yourself as a good saucer underneath the cup of your parents' anointing. You gotta position yourself right. Ain't nobody leaving or giving you anything if you keep acting like a fool. One of the curses killing our generation, because most of us started at ground zero anyway, every, in fact, every, is that every generation has to start over at ground zero. And that is a curse. Why is that a curse? It is the curse because it's it's a curse of not having anything left to be a refuge or a fortress to the next generation. And consequently, since nobody ever gave to you, and you're talking about a God who thinks and works generationally, you can't talk about to God about blessings. So if you don't start thinking generationally until you get a passion for your children and your children's children to see the blessing of the Lord build for the next ones in line. What does the Bible say? Write the vision. Make it plain that they that hear it may follow. Forward thinking people is what this church needs. Forward Forward thinking people is what the church needs. Forward thinking people is what this nation needs. Forward thinking people are the ones positioning themselves to be blessed. You're always thinking in terms of what's next and who's next. I'm telling y'all, anywhere you use that principle, you're going to be blessed. I don't care how good you are in a moment. If you fail to plan, you fail, period. Write the vision and make it plain. So God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I'm your exceeding great reward. And he said, thanks, God. I appreciate it. But God, I don't have a son. And he said, Abraham, come with me. Okay. And so Abraham and God walk out. And as they walk out, it's a beautiful starlit night. It's for air pollution. And God said, Abraham, look up. He said, okay, I'll look up. He said, count the stars. God, I can't count the stars. There's too many stars, too many. There's gazillions and gazillions. and There's too many stars for any man to count. And God said, so shall your seed be. So shall your descendants be. But I don't have a son. And he took him out on the ocean. Took him out on the beach. Took him out in the desert where the sand is. And said, Abraham, stop. Yeah, count the grains of sand. I can't count the grains of sand, Father. There's too many. There's, there's too many grains of sand for too many for any man to count. There's, just, there's gazillions and gazillions and gazillions of grains of sand. I can't count them. He said, so shall your descendants be. Some... Glad morning. Any old school Christians in here? Some glad morning. When all this life is over, you and I will rise, whether it's meeting Jesus in the clouds or meeting him at the throne. You and I will rise. And sitting in the bosom of a holy God is the promised father of the faith, a man named Abraham. And he's laying back one day and suddenly he hears the sound of marching steps by the gazillions coming. And he says, Father, who's that coming over the horizon? Look at that. And God says, count them, Abraham. I 
can't count them, God. There's gazillions and gazillions. There's too many for any man to count. And he said, Abe, that's your exceeding great reward. That is your descendants. I need somebody in this moment to leave this church and believe that God will do for you as you begin to focus your life the correct way to building the right things so that one day you will look up and all the sacrifices you've endured, all the pain you've endured, all the all the beat downs that turned into blessings and you will sit there in the bosom of God and see the generation coming after you saying that old man, that old woman right there was a bad motor scooter and you lived your life proclaiming my money is building something. Amen.